welcome. Hope you guys are all ready to learn some interesting stuff. Get that thinking cap on. We're talking about brain function here. No falling asleep. Yes. All right. <laughs> but really, we're going to be going into a lot of science today. Uh -oh. So I hope you brought your notes. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> now, I want to ask you guys one question first. Would you rather have a back problem or a brain problem? Back. Brain, back. Oh. Neither. Now, really think about that. Would you rather have a backache, a back problem, or would you rather have a brain problem? Brain problem. You'd rather have a brain problem. Because you can fix it. This was supposed to be an easy question, guys. Okay, 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 okay. Here, here, here. Here, let's, 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 let's take it from this angle. Would you rather have your child have a brain issue, a brain degenerative disorder, or would you rather have them have a backache, a back problem? Okay, thank you. Finally. Yes, you guys, this is awesome. Now, just the notion of even losing your mental capacity, losing brain function, evokes twice as much fear among American adults than losing, say, a physical ability. I mean, that's huge. Once you lose your memory, I mean, what's the use of anything, really? And so, I keep hitting this laser pointer here. And you know, 60% of adults currently in the US are actually fearful of losing their memory as they get older. And that's an issue because what we're gonna be talking about today, it's completely 100% preventable. And that's what we're gonna be going into. And before we go into this and really what the chiropractic adjustment does, because you know, we're gonna talk about three ways to stimulate brain function. I had to lead with chiropractic, of course. Now, when you're talking about the senses of the body, most people are going to say, oh, we have five senses, right? You got touch, how you sense pain, how you feel pain. You got smell, you got taste, sound, sight. Did you know that we actually have a sixth sense, though? Yeah, the movie. Sort of that's, yes, it, that's it's, it's right? not, yeah, yeah, you're thinking of like, you know, the pineal gland maybe, no. But really what this is is, Say that I put my finger like this, or my hand like this, and I put it behind my back. Well, I know exactly where my finger is, but I can't see it, I can't feel it, you know, I can't smell it, can't taste it, so how do I know? In fact, if I take this hand, I can literally touch my finger every time, but how do I know that? It's your sixth sense, it's called proprioception. Proprioception is your body's awareness of space. You know, I don't know why they don't talk about it, but it is the sixth sense we have. It's your body's awareness in space. In fact, every single muscle, tendon, ligament, joint of your body has thousands of these proprioceptors. And it's constantly sending thousands of signals through the spinal cord up to your brain to let you know where your body's at in space. So right now I know exactly where my limbs are going because I'm literally sending thousands of nerve signals to my brain telling me, giving the brain that sensory input to tell me where I'm at. And so, what this proprioception is so important because proprioception stimulates brain function. Now, if you guys get one thing out of this talk today, everyone say proprioception. Proprioception. S stimulates, everyone say brain function. Stimulates brain function. Okay, if you guys just get that part down, you guys are gonna be smarter than 99% okay. of people out there. And so, neuroplasticity, which is your body's ability to make new brain cells. It's like your body's, it's your brain's dynamic ability to regenerate itself, form new neural connections. That's called neuroplasticity. And it, it needs proprioception to happen. Because we all know that you can make new brain cells, right? Mm -hmm. It used to be thought that once you lose them, they're gone forever. It's not true anymore. It's called neuroplasticity. So we actually can regenerate new brain cells. And so here, when we talk about the, the effects of not being adjusted, this is the pathway here. First, you're gonna have inflammation in the body. And then once you have inflammation, you get stiffness in your joints. They become dysfunctional, they're not able to move properly. And so when your joints aren't moving properly, then that causes your body to send a lot less proprioceptive signals to your brain. And so that really, really turns your brain to you know, the out of or order sign. You know, has anyone ever just sat around all day and done nothing? Yes. You're conserving all your energy all day, every day. And even though you're conserving your energy, you feel like a slug. Mm -hmm. You feel brain dead. Mm -hmm. 
And it's like, how is that? I, I was conserving my energy. How come I don't have this built up energy to the last? Well, it's because you're not feeding your brain those proprioceptive signals. When you're sitting there on the couch doing nothing, you're not, you're not emitting too much proprioceptive firings to watch, your brain. Watching TV. Watching TV, yes, but are you moving? Are you doing anything? Mm -hmm. Remember, it's your body's awareness in space. Watching TV, you still know where your body's at. You're sitting there flat on the couch doing nothing. <laughs> it doesn't change. So that's why movement is so crucial. And then when this gets there, when you have less proprioceptive firings to your brain, you process, it's causing your brain to process a lot less info. And it actually will decrease every single sense of your body. You're going to be able to see, you see less, you hear less, you feel less. And that's why too, the body's, the very first chiropractic adjustment was done in 1895 on a deaf guy named Harvey Lillard. And what happened is that he was adjusted right in the supper back here. And what happened is that that one adjustment over a hundred years ago restored someone's hearing. Mm. Now, do you think there's a nerve from the top part of your back going to your ear? Mm -hmm. No. 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 There's not. So it didn't unpinch a nerve going to your ear. What it did though is it did this right here. Proprioceptive it increased proprioceptive firings to the brain. That proprioceptive input changed the way your brain functions. It stimulates all the senses of the body. When you change brain function, since the brain controls everything, you change physiology. Okay. So that change in brain function, that heightened new sense, sense of awareness, that's what restored his hearing. And it wasn't unpinching a nerve going to his ear. A lot of people explain it that way because it's easy, but it's just not accurate. And so here, what happens is, when we're talking about, remember, would you rather have a back problem or a brain problem? The back problem comes with this, when you have stiffness or a, dif a dysfunctional joint. Mm -hmm. Your brain problem is what it results. So did you guys know that all your back problems are actually a brain problem? And that's really what we're focused on. Because once we change physiology, your body can actually decrease inflammation and it fixes that. I mean, that's really what we're doing. So every, all you guys have a brain problem. <laughs> I know. Well, welcome. <laughs> so, what does the chiropractic adjustment do? We make the adjustment on a dysfunctional joint that's not moving properly. What this is doing is it's increasing proprioceptive input and it goes up and it actually goes into an area called the cerebellum of your brain, this back portion of your head there. And your cerebellum is what contains 80% of the entire body's brain cells, neurons, right in this back portion here. It receives all mechanical stimulation. And then from the cerebellum, it goes to an area called your thalamus. Then the thalamus sends it to every single area of your body. Like we said, increasing, doesn't just increase the volume of your brain, it increases just the functioning, all height, heightens all your senses. So, here, in the Journal of Neuroplasticity, this study literally just came out last, in two weeks ago actually. They came out with the conclusion, the function of your spine affects the function of your brain. And so what they did is they said, they actually studied a chiropractic adjustment on a dysfunctional joint and they measured brain function. And specifically, they were measuring the function of your prefrontal cortex, which is kind of like the conductor of your brain, has to do with higher learning and cognition. And what they found out is that the, the adjustment massively stimulated the prefrontal cortex. And so just by this study alone, documenting, I mean, this is a very reputable journal, that explains why we see improvements in brain function of our patients, memory, concentration, motor function, but it just doesn't stop there because you're seeing increases in balance, decision making, attention, intelligence. So that's all from that prefrontal cortex stimulation from the chiropractic adjustment. And where is it, why is it? It's because of the increased proprioceptive firings to the brain. Now, when you change brain function, like we talked about, you change physiology. You're changing everything. So this is actually a quote from that study. The study showed a change in brain function by almost 20% on average from the adjustment. Now that's not from you know, your total amount of care, that's from literally each adjustment. You're stimulating brain function. So if you ever have a test to take, get adjusted first. <laughs> it helps, okay? And then here, this is the opening sentence of this study. There has been a growing body of evidence to suggest that neural plastic changes, your body's ability to make new brain cells, occurs following chiropractic spinal manipulation. And this is in the journal. This is not a chiropractic journal. This is the Journal of Neuroplasticity. Very huge. So, 
That's for the chiropractic adjustment. And now for the second way to stimulate brain function is something called intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. Now cool. intermittent fasting is not a diet. It's basically just a pattern of eating. It's not calorie restriction. It's nothing of that sort. It's just a pattern of eating where basically you narrow down the window you eat each day. So instead of eating you know, every two to three hours each and every day, you're narrowing your eating window. And if you guys have any other questions about this, I would watch the intermittent fasting talk I did you know, about a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And that's on the YouTube channel as well. But this pattern of eating mimics the eating habits of your ancestors and of the hunter-gatherers. You see, they never had uh, grocery stores, fast food chains on each block. They, they always went through cycles of feast and famine. They always, and, and what they found out is that when you actually fast intermittently throughout the day, this cycle of periodic eating actually had tons of biochemical benefits. And when you do this type of eating, it actually makes your body this super optimal functioning machine. And that's just because that's the way we were destined to eat. Okay. So... This is actually a direct quote. The most common eating pattern in modern societies, three meals plus snacks every day is abnormal from an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. And this is from the National Academy of Sciences because it is, you know, we're taught even by every dietitian, everything, eat every two hours to keep your metabolism high. And then if you follow up that question with, well, can I see some research on that? They're going to look at you with a blank stare because there's never been research done on that mm -hmm. claim, yet everyone teaches it. It's kind of like when we used to think the, earl, the world was flat. You know, we believed that for thousands of years. Yeah, wasn't true, was it? Mm -mm. So what this does is intermittent fasting causes this increase in a substance called BDNF. It's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, this substance actually activates brain stem cells. And Remember, we talked about neuroplasticity. It's your body's ability to make new neural connections, to make new brain cells. Neuroplasticity requires BDNF. So if to make new brain cells, to keep your brain at optimal functioning, you need BDNF, you got to look at the activities that increase BDNF. And that's intermittent fasting, and that's also exercise. And we'll talk about exercise later, but intermittent fasting is huge because it's shown, it's not just a mere small increase, it increases this substance in your brain from 50% to up to 400%. No one knows this stuff. If you want a mental edge on anybody, intermittent fast, seriously. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah, and so even this, one of the biggest areas of increase is an area called your hippocampus, which has to do with, which is a part of your brain, it's deep into your temporal lobes, has to do with higher learning and memory. And so, by increasing BDNF, you're basically regenerating massive stem cells in your hippocampus, causing you to think better, to learn better, to concentrate more. Does anyone want that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and so here, it's actually been shown to increase the function of neural health and also prevent it from breaking down. And this is exactly that degradation of neurons is what happens in things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even things like epilepsy. So any neurodegenerative disorder BDNF actually counteracts that. And so they did a study on mice that already had Alzheimer's. Whatever they did, they, did, they injected something in them that made all these mice have Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's. And then they put them on an intermittent fasting regimen for six months. And it, no, sorry, they put them on an intermittent fasting regimen and it delayed their memory loss by six months by adding, BDN, or by adding intermittent fasting, which increased BDNF. Now, since a rat has a very small lifespan compared to us, in equivalence to human life, that's up to 20 years. So think about now with people with Alzheimer's or anything, think if we could delay their memory loss by 20 years. You think that would affect some families out there? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's huge because Alzheimer's is devastating. They can't remember your name. They don't even know their own children. I mean, it's, it's, it's very devastating. It's no joke there. And also what's cool is that BDNF has massive protective effects on your neuromuscular junction. And your neuromuscular junction is basically where the nerve uh, stimulates the muscle. So you can see here on this picture, you have, that's a, that's a spinal column, that's your spinal cord. You got a nerve coming out and right where that nerve supplies your muscle fiber, that's called a neuromuscular junction. And when that thing breaks down, that's why people lose muscle strength as they age. Because they're losing their neuromuscular junction uh, capability. It starts to break down as you age. Now, BDNF counteracts that. 
So if we intermittent fast and apply that and exercise, you're, gonna, you're, you're not gonna have this muscle degradation as you age. Mm -hmm. You're gonna maintain proper muscle mass. And so if you think about it, the muscle is basically your engine. The neuromuscular junction is your ignition. Is an engine an engine's pretty much useless without the ignition. So you really need both. My brain can't communicate to my muscle. My muscle's not, it's not, it's gonna be useless. So that is huge right there. And then another part of intermittent fasting that's so crucial is its ability to use ketones as fuel. So when your body needs energy, I'm first gonna go after, you know, I'm first gonna go after my blood sugar. So I'm gonna utilize my blood sugar for energy, for instant energy. Once that glucose, that blood sugar is gone, I'm then going to go after my glycogen stores. And that's in your muscle, that's in your liver. Once the glycogen scores are gone, stores are gone, then I'm left with nothing else but my fat stores to go after. And it's only then, when you get your fat stores, it takes about eight hours after a meal. So only after eight hours after you eat your last meal is when your body has enough time to burn through your blood glucose and your muscle glycogen, leaving only your fat stores available. So that again just makes these dietitians and these nutritionists look so stupid because they're advocating eat every two hours. Well, if you eat every two hours, you're constantly replenishing your glycogen and your blood sugar. So how are you ever gonna hit your fat stores and lose fat if you go by these diets they're claiming? You know, diets are a multi-billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. And the more billions they spend, the fatter we get. So it's like, hello, you know, the, the math isn't adding up here. So because they're doing the complete wrong advice. So eight hours after a meal is when we finally start to use our fat stores. Now, our body's used to using glucose as energy. So when we use ketones as energy, your liver actually breaks down that fat and it turns it into ketones for our body to use. It turns out ketones is a much cleaner fuel than glucose. And in fact, it actually has these memory protective effects of your brain cells when you use ketones as fuel. So by intermittent fasting, you're gonna force your body to use ketones as your primary fuel, not glucose, which actually has protective benefits to your brain, stimulates brain function, all of that stuff. Memory, learning, everything. Hang on until after, okay? And then, um, last thing that intermittent fasting does, you know, intermittent fasting, I'm writing a book on it right now, there's tons of benefits, but we're just talking one specifically to the brain. There's a, proce there's a process in the body that's called um, autophagy. And it's kind of a weird word. And autophagy is basically your body's way of cellular cleansing, getting rid of all like the bad dysfunctional parts so your body can regenerate itself properly. It's kind of like what your skin does. It, it uh, sheds itself of dead skin cells so it can regenerate into healthy new cells. It's what your bone does. It gets rid of the crappy bone and it stimulates new formation of bone. And so, it's just a way of your body to stay fresh and healthy. Um, Colin Champ, a guy out of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, he described it as, think of autophagy as our body's innate recycling program. Autophagy makes us more efficient machines to get rid of faulty parts, stop cancerous growths, and stop metabolic dysfunction like obesity and diabetes. So this is an absolute crucial process. And what they found out is that by intermittent fasting, you massively stimulate the effect of autophagy. You boost that ability to regenerate itself and constantly just cleaning out your brain tissue, making new healthy brain cells. That is huge. And so it upregulates that entire process. And so if you think about it, if you're ridding your brain of constantly of this dysfunctional parts, parts you're actually going to increase the longevity of your body. You're going to increase lifespan, what they found out. Now this is just, I mean, and it's just by intermittent fasting. You don't have to calorie restrict on this. Just by merely skipping breakfast, you can apply this and get these massive benefits. So cool. And so the third way to stimulate brain function is just exercise. Now, in the Journal of Neurology, a study published not too long ago, they found out that physical exercise decreases age-related brain shrinkage. It increases memory and it promotes neuroplasticity, your body's ability to make new brain cells, just by exercising. You now we all know exercise has many benefits. Do we still do it? Not, not a whole lot. In fact, 80% of the people out there don't even re meet the recommended requirements, and it's roughly like three hours a week of exercise. 80% doesn't meet that. And so in the book called Spark, it even, they did all these uh, studies and they showed that it fights dementia. It, it literally cures or, uh, Alzheimer's. 
Exercise. By the proprioceptive firings it gives to the brain, which stimulates brain function. It's going to increase your gray matter in your brain, and especially the hippocampus. Remember, we talked about the hippocampus, learning and memory, the higher levels of learning. You increase the gray matter in the hippocampus, you're changing the way your entire brain operates here. And also, what's good news is that they showed that just adding an exercise program later in life, it still wasn't too late to get those brain benefits, those brain protective benefits. So everyone can start this, it's not too late. And what, when you look at what you, what we're used to seeing today is this type of lifestyle. We're sitting at a desk all day, you know, we're at the computer all day, just eating on the go. And the problem is, is that a sedentary lifestyle leads to brain shrinkage. Less proprioceptive firings to the brain, you're not getting that stimulation needed for proper brain health, so it shrinks. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So it leads to brain shrinkage, memory loss, cognitive issues, and so direct correlation between low physical fitness and a smaller brain volume. And that's just huge. And so just the dangers of sitting too often, not only when you're sitting do you not, you basically shunt all blood flow to your extremities because your body needs skeletal muscle contraction to stimulate blood flow. Just by sitting there, that's why sitting so bad, you're not, you don't have no blood flow. Everyone stand up. I'm serious actually. Stand up. <laughs> And sit down. All right. Now, little muscle contraction there. But no joke, you block blood flow from that lack of stimulation. And also, too, when you're not moving, your body doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't need to utilize those proprioceptors in the body. So you're getting less stimulation to the brain. So, what does exercise do? Exercise will decrease the amount of stiffness in your joints. Decreased amount of stiffness then means that you're going to increase proprioceptive firings to the brain. It's going to make your brain very healthy and strong, okay? And it's also going to increase the size of your brain. So, the mechanism, why does it do that? Well, we already know it increases the proprioceptive firings and it improves blood flow. Again, this is why the more we move, the more we feel alert. When we don't move, when we don't exercise, we feel brain dead and in a brain fog. That's the same reason why right here. Now, Exercise also increases BDNF. It's the other thing besides intermittent fasting that increases this protein in our body that stimulates brain stem cells. And then MRFs are just muscle regulatory factors that also help with stem cell health. And so you're looking at this, it, exercise, we talked about how it helps Alzheimer's patients. It reduces damaging plaques in our body that causes basically memory loss. So exercise is huge. And so this is perhaps not very good news for me, but a new study out there showing that among all lifestyle factors, leg strength is perhaps the best factor that determines your brain health. Okay. Now my legs are kind of small, you know, they, they could be stronger, you know, dang it. You know, hey, watch it. <laughs> so not the best news for me, but I mean, just incorporating some squats, you know, if you're at the desk, you know, sitting up and doing a couple squats, a couple lunges, even just some leg extensions. Walking even is going to be a, is going to make a huge difference to your brain function, and so what's cool is part of this study they looked at non-exercise movements, and that's things like having a standing desk. You know, I'm not exercising right now, but I'm standing, so that's considered a non-exercise movement. Even just having a standing desk, you know, taking the stairs, simply walking while you're on the phone, that makes a huge difference. And I'm kind of weird. My fiance took a picture of me the other day. And here, I'm watching the NBA playoffs. <laughs> I'm on my headphones talking on the phone with my dad while I'm jumping on the trampoline. Is that what that is? That's a little trampoline, yeah. So that's like, that's multitasking right there for you guys, okay? And I mean, and it's so easy because when you're, you know, jumping, when you're walking on the phone, you don't even think about what you're doing. You're literally thinking about the conversation, so you're exercising without even thinking about it. Okay. And you're still getting all the benefits. So just walking, you know, and I, I like to pace when I'm on the phone anyway, just regardless. You know, I'll walk around the counter or something, just anything like that. But that's literally what I do at home, and uh, it's effective. And so certain exercises increase this compound called BDNF more than others. In fact, high intensity interval training is by far the most superior type of exercise to increase that brain compound, to stimulate brain stem cells. And HIT training is what I call it. High intensity interval training is just basically where you alternate um, high intensity and then rest. 
So you're doing high, you're doing a lot of intervals. You're not just doing a steady state cardio for an hour, which is really not effective. And when you do this type of exercise, you're going to have by far superior benefits in fat loss, muscle mass, human growth hormone production, which is basically your fitness hormone, keeps you just healthy and vibrant throughout life, reduces age, aging, and again, you're going to have way more increases in BDNF by doing this type, because it's all about intensity here. And uh, right here. The good news about HIIT training is that you can do it with any exercise. You can do it with any cardio machine, elliptical, you know, stationary bike, rowing machine, anything. You can do it by walking, you can do it swimming, you can do it squatting, you can do it with push-ups. Any exercise. And the cool part for most people is that you can do it when you're walking. Speed walk for a minute and a half, you know, relax and walk slower for a minute and a half. You know, speed walking, speed walking is actually kind of hard, really, if you try it. But uh, it, it, you can get the same benefits even just walking. So just incorporating this into your walking regimen. Instead of just walking at steady pace for an hour, you can do 20 minutes of HIIT training and it'll be by far much more effective than that full hour long, even though you're spending a third of the time. And so we talked about three ways and I have to do an honorable mention. Do you guys mind? Talk about one more factor with brain function. Because nutrition's kind of important, yeah? Yes. And just briefly, healthy fats are absolutely crucial for brain function. Absolutely. And they found out the American Heart Association, of all people, they came out and said, if we just increase our consumption of healthy fats, we would save over a million lives in the U.S. alone. That's just alone. And then, honestly, if you do the research, that's actually an understatement, but still, the fact that they said that, you know, who are advocates of surgery and drugs, that's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, increase your consumption of healthy fats. And they basically said that there's no scientific basis for ever cutting out fat. You know, we always think of eating a low fat diet, absolutely harmful for your brain. Your brain's 70% fat. Less fat equals less building blocks to your brain, really. And so, combined eating healthy fats with reducing the amount of refined carbs and sugar, and then also doing intermittent fasting as a way of eating, you're gonna massively increase your BDNF, your brain-derived neurotrophic factor to help your brain health. And so, if you look at our ancestors, because every time we're looking at new healthy things, we always, th we always find these breakthroughs and really it's just what our ancestors did. You know, oh, they did, they did high intensity interval training. When did our ancestors ever go running on a marathon at a steady, slow pace? No, when they were hunting, they would go through periods of sprinting and then relaxing, you know, they were always on the go. They never just would just, I'm just gonna go on a nice slow run for an hour, you know, <laughs> never happened, never happened, yeah. In fact, it's not very fun either, but anyway. So, ans <laughs> our ancestral diet, high in healthy fats, void of sugar, and literally of all non-vegetable and non-fruit non, uh, carbohydrates. So they weren't eating a ton of bread either. In fact, ever since the agricultural revolution, which is about 10,000 years ago, we've never even consumed bread. So it's like this, uh, you know, you can, this, uh, all these grains and stuff that we're eating, it's when they started making all these grains in these vast fields. But before that, you just have like a little piece of wheat here and there. And if you were just looking for just wheat for your diet, you'd actually be burning more calories trying to find the wheat than you would by consuming it. So it just wasn't a big staple in their diets. And so things you can incorporate right now, avocados, grass-fed butter, raw dairy, pastured egg yolks, coconut, any type of nut oil, avocado oil, raw nuts, grass-fed meat. And the reason why those are so beneficial is because we have this pathway again. Inflammation leads to stiffness, leads to decreased proprioceptive firings, leads to brain dysfunction. Well, one of the biggest contributors to inflammation in, form of, in the form of nutrition is a unhealthy omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Because your omega-6s are your pro-inflammatory -inflam fats Omega-3s are your anti-inflammatory fats. So if we're consuming way more pro-inflammatory omega-6s versus omega-3s, you're gonna cause a lot of inflammation leading to this entire pathway damaging your brain. So it really does, it's not just eat more fat, it's eat more healthy fat. You know, any trans fat, any type of that, you're actually gonna be destroying your brain. So it, you, gotta be, you gotta know what's difference. And this whole thing about this, this war against fat, if you will, and what even medical doctors are still advocating to this day, all stems from this dude right here. Ansel Keys. <laughs> this guy is ridiculous. So medical doctors still look at this guy as like God. 
you know, oh, he's just the father of, you know, modern medicine. So this guy, what a genius. He did a study and he first had the pre-notion that saturated fat leads to heart disease. And he wanted to go and do a study on that. So what he did is he did a study and he took data from 22 different countries or he looked at 22 different countries. And he came at the conclusion that indeed saturated fat leads to more heart disease. So he looked at the data of 22. Now, in his final conclusion, he only used the data of seven countries out of the 22. And you're thinking, hmm. And you guessed it. The other 15 countries, they didn't support his data at all. Mm -hmm. So we left those out. So he only took seven that actually made a little linear graph to show the correlation between saturated fat and heart disease. Now, again, he didn't include things like France, who has a very, very high fat content, virtually no heart disease. He didn't include those countries, you know, because that didn't fit his data. And so he had a huge agenda going on here. And I just have to share with you a couple of these graphs here. The x-axis here is the amount of fat. So the more you go on the right of that graph, the more fat. The y-axis, the vertical one, that's the amount of heart disease. So you see here, even those red dots, that's extremely high fat, extremely low heart disease. So this is the plot he got. Now what did he conclude? He used seven countries and made a linear graph. The more fat, the more heart disease. But he only picked seven countries. And literally these doctors just look at this guy as just like the father of medicine. I mean, it's just crazy. And so if you just use different set of data points, you'll get a negative correlation <laughs> with the more fat, the less heart disease. I mean, it's crazy. So it just depends on what he didn't use all the data. So this is, that's actually scientific fraud right there. Let's look at another one. Oh, another negative correlation. Weird. Just by using different countries. So he literally just picked seven to make it look like that. And the seven countries he used, the U.S. being one of them, they had the most sugar in their diet. So when they actually did an analysis of all those countries, it was sugar that leaded to the most heart disease, not saturated fat. Because saturated fat is in all animal protein. And so we think of saturated fat as bad. It's absolutely not bad. Yeah, so healthy uh, grass-fed animal protein is absolutely is, is great for you. That's why we have incisors, these teeth, to break out meat. So we're actually meant to have meat. The problem is that our meat is just so poisonous now with antibiotics, hormones, that it's hard to find that good grass-fed meat now. You know, even organic doesn't mean grass-fed, and it's a completely different nutrient profile. So there you have it. Now, Again, degenerative disorders, you know, brain dysfunction is just is on the skyrocket. Cognitive decline is skyrocketing now in the US and it's just really important that it is 100% preventable. And so just by applying these factors, you know, you're, you're not only is it gonna help you guys, but just sharing this info, it's gonna help everybody. And just here's a list of references. Thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. Thank you. And questions, yes. Okay, so BDNF stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Neurotrophic factor. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. During this fasting, uh, mm -hmm. is it okay to drink water during this? Of course. Fasting? Yeah, water is perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. Encouraged. But juices, no. Juice, no. Sugars. Juice has sugars, so juicing is fantastic for you, but not during mm -hmm. your fasted period. You can consume it when you're eating and during your eating window, mm -hmm. but not outside of it. What are ketones? Ketones, it's, a, it's when your body's using fat as fuel, your liver breaks down the fat into ketones for your primary energy source for your body. So usually we use glucose. It's blood sugar, gets turned into glucose in our body, and that's what everything uses. But when you're in a fasted state from intermittent fasting, like we were talking about, it forces your body, because we deplete our body of glucose, so it forces your body to go after fat which in your liver turns that into ketones for your body to use, which is a lot cleaner form of energy. Do you have a question? I was wondering why, well, how diabetics get around that, people that have low blood sugar well, problems. Yeah. You know, they always say that's where the two hours, you know, right. four hours. But uh, diabetics also have a ton of insulin resistance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now intermittent fasting is one of the best ways to normalize insulin sensitivity. Yeah, but like, like applying any certain thing, at first it could be a little shock to the body, but after about a week or two, your body adapts and doesn't need that. Now with diabetics or you say, you know, you'd want to use extreme caution to kind of monitor them a little bit more. So mm -hmm. people with just adrenal fatigue and that, yeah. but I mean, yeah, it, even some people 
if they don't eat after four hours, they've got a headache, you know, they feel miserable. So right, I mean, but it's people it's like, yeah, but people addicted to caffeine, if they go out with coffee for a couple hours, they feel miserable too. Doesn't mean that they need coffee to survive. You know, after about a week, they start to adapt and kind of function normally again. With intermittent fasting, the only thing you got to deal with is how I do it. I don't eat breakfast. So just by making your first meal at lunch, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, and what you can do, and what I do, is I do something called, uh, I do a special type of coffee in the morning. I do black organic coffee, but I add coconut oil, and I add grass-fed butter. And what that does, it has absolutely no carbohydrates, so it doesn't stimulate any insulin, in insulin increase or sugar increase in my body. And that can actually kind of just hold you off, if you will. And also, th those uh, healthy fats with your organic coffee is actually really good to absorb all those good antioxidants from the coffee as well. So that's something you can do. It's like bulletproof. It's like bulletproof, but bulletproof advocates they uh, bulletproof is like a brand of a thing called you know a brain octane oil they like to sell, which is just basically coconut oil, but they've like refined it into some special thing and they process it. And I'm just not a big fan of this thing. I think it's kind of like a money scheme where they're trying to sell their product. And if you look in the ingredients, it just says coconut oil. And if it's found in nature, to me that's good enough. I don't want anything extra processed or anything. If it's found in nature, that's probably what we're meant to have anyway. Lemon yeah. Water. You lemon, water? lemon actually has trace amounts of carbs, so it's not the it's not the most ideal situation. However, it's so minuscule that I don't think it would have a huge effect. But it's I wouldn't say it's ideal either. Yeah. Does eight hours of sleep count as fasting? Of course. Yeah. That's why it's so easy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're literally fasting for, so any time, remember, after eight hours after you eat your last meal is when your body's burning your fat stores. So if you're eating every two to three hours, and also too, what's interesting is that when you're not eating, your insulin stays low. When your insulin stays low, you're, you're releasing massive amounts of growth hormone. Growth hormone and insulin are inversely related. So that's why we always say, oh, we release growth hormone at night. So we always knew that, but it's because we're not eating at night. So insulin stays low, which is why. So now, if you do intermittent fasting, not only are you going to be releasing tons of growth hormone at night, but it's also going to be during the other eight hours of your fast when you get up. Yep. So I have two questions. Uh, I've heard that you shouldn't eat a lot before you go to bed. And the other question is, what is better for us, uh, especially women, I guess, uh, omega-3s or omega-6s? Omega-3s. Omega-3s omega yes. better for us. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. That's the problem in the first place is having too many omega sixes. Yeah. Okay. So omega three is for sure. Yeah. 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 Are you taking an omega six pill? I'm taking omegas, but I don't. I think it's a combination. If it's if you're taking an omega supplement, it's going to be omega threes. Okay. If that okay. supplement okay. company has. Omega sixes all together, or still have some in the mix? Is well, the you supplement know? you would want to take is just omega threes. <laughs> You're going to get omega 6s like from a healthy chia seeds. You're still going to have trace amounts of that. But the important thing is, it's not eliminating all omega 6s, it's having a good ratio. Okay. We already get way too much omega 6s. So your primary goal is to increase omega 3s. Okay. Yeah. And is it okay to eat right before you go to bed? Well, it, it's not, it's, it, you know, so the reason why I like to skip breakfast is because it sucks going to bed with a hungry stomach. <laughs> I can't do it. I just get pissed off and start <laughs> punching my bed or something. <laughs> but, uh, so it helps to go to bed when you're feeling, uh, you know, satiety. But and th with that said, you still don't want to eat right before you go to bed because you're basically, you're, what, what really you're doing is you're increasing a lot of energy that you just consumed, but you're not utilizing that energy. So that, that's why, you know, you're basically giving yourself all this energy that you're not utilizing. So it does get stored that way. So that's why it's not the best thing to do right before you go to bed. So many hours before... Yeah, I mean, like... You know, Mercola says three, but that's extreme for my lifestyle. I can't do that. You know, I, I'm in bed by like 8.30, 9. So if I'm working here till 6.30, I go home, have dinner at like 7.30, like, yeah. So it's not going to happen every time, but I try not to eat right before I go to bed. You know, we are human at the end of the day, but you just kind of got to work around yeah. it the best.